Welcome to Discover the Difference, a podcast brought to you by C3. My name's Jamie Reed, and I'll be your host today, along with my buddy who has a little more hair than me, Gabriel Earl. Today we have Dave Sanderson on the show, and he's just full of inspiration. He's most well known for being one of the last passengers off the Miracle on Hudson after helping everybody else off the plane in freezing cold water. But his story doesn't start there, doesn't even end there. He became the head of security for Tony Robbins and the story of how he even came to work for Tony and advance all the way up to become his head of security is so inspirational right up to the moment that Tony calls him in and essentially fires him, tells him, hey, it's time for you to pursue your dream and your passion. And he launches his own leadership and consulting company following in Tony's footsteps as somebody who embraces, endorses the books that he's published, you're just gonna find so much to love about Dave and take away as inspiration to apply in your lives. So enjoy this episode. I think Bun was telling me a story about you that you didn't train for that swim in the Hudson, did you with the Navy SEALs? Uh, was, so is that a three mile swim? I. I I learned to swim in 1966, and the last time I really swam was 1979. So when Suzanne asked if I wanted to swim with her in the Hudson River, I'm like, um, I need more information. So I actually <laughs> went back, not swimming since 1979 in 100 days to swim the Hudson River with the SEALs. Holy smoke. So you train for 100 days, and then you swim three miles with a bunch of Navy SEALs. That's correct. That's Did correct. you just... Did they have to catch up to you or how did that work? They were following you? <laughs> no, not quite. Um, <laughs> Suzanne is a tremendous wingman. She and I still are stayed. I think we finished fifth from the back. But you know what? It's about finishing, right? It's not about speed. That's right. Because uh, right. my, my swimming partner this year, last weekend, she's a champion swimmer. Um, and she can swim like nobody's business. And I'm a slow and steady guy. So, well, I mean, swimming three miles, any way you do it is a major accomplishment. I mean, that, that is a, I mean, running three miles is a lot for, for some people doing it in the water is, I mean, that's, that's big. Well, that's, you know, we did a, we did a mile run, including pushups and then the swim doing pushups and a mile run at the end. So yeah. Oh, was, oh yeah. It was two miles of running 3.1 miles of swimming. I candidly, I did not do the pull-ups. I did 22 push-ups at each stop where they were doing 100. So. Oh my gosh. How many people participated in this? I think this year the number was 201. I think last year was 188. I think this year was like 200 or 201. Wow. So what was the, the impetus? Out there in the water. Yeah. What was, what was the impetus to make this all happen? Like to get involved in this, uh, to go back to the Hudson and uh, swim? Well, last year was a different motivation to be very candid. Yes, I wanted to raise money for the, the, the veterans are falling hard at times. I got a passion for the military. But last year was more about going back to the Hudson River where I almost lost my life and getting redemption. That was last year's motivation. This year's motivation was to see how much I improved, but more, how could I support and raise more money? Uh, and take somebody who had not been an open water swimmer, my, my swim buddy, into a body of water, which is extremely challenging. So it was, uh, you know, and I just, I love being around the guys, SEAL guys hold you, to, tell people, one of the things about SEALs, as you may know, they hold you to a higher standard. And yep. it helps me raise my standard. And I can show people how, and I can think, of one part of my talk now is how to go from zero to swing with the SEALs in 100 days. How do you do that? Right? Well, how do you? I, I show the strategy on how I did it and, Part of that is how to raise your standard. Wow. Yeah. Well, we want to dig into that, but just to kind of uh, go back to the listeners that um, don't know about, you know, the miracle on the Hudson. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? And then also that kind of feeds into the redemption part that you went back to, you know, after that experience. Yeah. Thank you. So, you know, I, um, it's the short version of a long story that I wasn't supposed to be on that plane. I got off off work. You know, we were working in a distribution center in Brooklyn, New York. That one opened up at two o'clock in the morning. So we wanted to be in the middle of all the action because we were looking at their systems. 
So we started our day about five o'clock. So we got done about 10. And I'm like, I get to go home early. So I, I gave up my first class seat at five o'clock for C15A on 1549 um, that afternoon. And nothing unusual, as you know, if you know the story, nothing unusual about the takeoff, but about 60 seconds in is when we heard the explosion. Uh, definitely got my attention because I was not paying attention. I mean, one thing I did not, you know, I fly 100 times a year. I know everything, right? You know everything until you don't know anything. Um, but then, you know, fortunately, we had a captain. He did an amazing job. I'll be forever grateful. But the captain who was had the skill sets to glide an Airbus because he had no power, and we're heading straight towards the George Washington Bridge. And fortunately, he missed the bridge by 400 feet. Wow. But now you're going to notice nose diving into the Hudson River. 36 degree water, 11 degree day. And I don't know about you, I've never seen another plane crash, plane crash that survived everybody. What was the atmosphere like as this all unfolds? It was very Like quiet. how much time did you have too? Like in between the time that you knew that things were not going right and when it happened? Approximately six minutes. It's six minutes, um, which goes by, it takes, it takes an hour to go six minutes. I mean, it's how slow time goes. But the yeah. plane was, was eerily silent. I, I mean, you talk to other passengers, they tell you the same thing. It was so quiet, you could hear a pin drop. Wow. And, uh, you know, I, I, I learned from another captain why that probably happened. It's because of the passenger makeup of the plane. And that, that came to me. I actually was flying from probably three or four weeks after this from Orlando to Charlotte. And I was in first class. I was getting some privileges, yes. They were bumping me up. Uh, and I got to talk to the captain. He gave me this insight that he said, look around you. He said, what kind of passengers are flying you know, on this plane from Orlando? Families, kids, older people, and a few business people. He said, your passenger maker was 180 degrees different in New York. 90% of our business people who can usually make decisions and act quickly. And he said, that's probably why this thing turned out the way it did. Because once the captain got it, he gets all the credit getting into the water. But it, once it's in the water, it's a team effort. It is a total team effort. It's not just one person. And uh, I think that's, that contributed to a lot of what happened that day. Because I think oh, yeah, if we haven't had a sure. different passenger for makeup, it would have been a lot different. Were there people that you know that you noticed in that that really stepped up, or did you feel like everybody did, or how did what was that? Were there certain people that said, "Hey, you know, we got to help everybody out. Um, let's work together." Like, what was that like? Yeah, I think I think one thing is leaders step up in times of crisis, and definitely there were some leaders that stepped up. And I'll give you an example. On the right side of the plane is where I went out. I went out at 10F on the right side of the plane. And the difference between the right side of the plane and the left side of the plane was dramatic because the right side of the plane, we didn't have any crew managing the door. Passengers had to manage the door, had to manage the exit with zero training. All the crew went out the left side of the plane. So they had that experience, but they had another issue. The left side of the plane was facing towards Manhattan, and that's where a majority, if not all, of the Aquaman and the helicopters were coming in, right? And the rotors, rotors were knocking people in the water. So they had a lot of people going in and out of the water a lot more. But we had to, people had to step up on the right side of the plane to lead. And that was a dramatic difference of how, how it turned out. Totally two different stories of how the rescue went. So are, in the six minutes, are they educating all the passengers of what steps are going to happen after you crash land in a, a body of water or everybody no. just activates? No. no. Um, the only thing you heard was brace, brace, brace. That's all you heard. Ooh, is it a hard it's landing? It's coming down, right? You're about 30 seconds and all you heard was brace, brace, brace. And after that, it was game on. Um, because water wow. started filling the plane immediately. The backside of the plane hit first and that ripped wide open. So water started coming in immediately. So depending where you were on that plane, I was on 15A towards the back. Water was about knee deep when I got up. In the back of the oh, plane, wow. it was about chest level deep. Wow. Oh my so God. People were trying to swim, so were trying to swim out. A different dynamic you got to deal with, right? Yeah. Yeah. So how did you, like, from the people that led, um, how, how did they lead, um, you know, to help people, um, you know, as far as saving their lives and directing them on, 
you know, where to go or what to do? Well, some people helped on the wing, getting people moved out on the wing. I think those leaders stepped up on their mind. What I did is I went towards the back of the plane, see if anybody needed help. And they were moving pretty well, but I just got behind everybody else. And, uh, you know, to make sure that there was nobody left in the back of the plane. And the water, that's why I, why I know the water was about chest deep, because I was chest deep in 36 degree water. But as I was trying to get out on the right side of the plane, I was getting out like everybody else. And then, but the boats and the wing were already filled up. And that's why I was oh, inside wow. the plane for roughly seven minutes, waist deep in 36 degree water. But how leaders stepped up, what I did is, one of, the, one of the things that happened on our side, on the right side of the plane, there was a lady and she wasn't moving. She was standing in the middle of the wing and she wasn't moving. And I believe she was probably in shock, scared, whatever kind Makes of sense. mentality, right? Yeah. Right. yeah. But when you're going so fast and this thing's going down, the plane's sinking, you got to move. There's no time to be standing around watching what's going on. So all the training that I've had, is when you get somebody in that situation, you got to do something dramatic to break them out of it. So I started yelling, just yelling at this lady. She didn't know who I was. I started yelling at her, but I got her attention. And she looked at me like, who's this old guy yelling at me? But then somebody <laughs> grabbed her arm and pulled her on the boat. And all of a sudden you see people walking down a wing. So I think you had to lead using the things that you learn. And one of the things the captain said was exactly correct. The leaders on the plane, all the things that you learn in your life, you had to cash in that one moment, right? All you at once. Cash, you had to cash everything at one time and just put it all out. There's like going in Vegas, right? You're going all in. And hopefully That's it's going to go well. Sometimes it doesn't, but fortunately for all of us, uh, the leaders uh, who put it all in, you know, scored well. So what was it that, like, um, that from your past experience and your past life that drove you to you know, go to the back of the plane versus go straight to the exit and get the heck out of there. What was it that, you know, led you That's that exactly way? That's exactly what happened. When I got, I was exiting. I, my, my game plan, once we were in the water and I saw that I was, I was, just, you know, aisle up out. In my mind, I said, aisle up out, man, aisle up out, aisle up out. But when I got to the aisle, that's what changed for me because I heard my mom start talking in my head and my mom passed away in 1997. But there was something I kept hearing in my head that she would tell me when I was young, it was, if you do the right thing, God will take care of you. Mm. And awesome. to me, the wow. right thing was you take care of other people first. I grew up in a small town. Everybody knew your name. It's like, it was like Mayberry, right? Everybody knows who you are. But you took care of everybody. So that's why I climbed over the seats to go towards the back of the plane. And Because if, if I didn't hear that, I probably would have gone out like everybody else. And someone asked me, I said, Is that, what, how you would have felt that? I was like, well, you know what? You know? You got to do what you got to do, right? So, you know, maybe leaving would have been a smart thing to do, but, you know, there were people in the back of the plane. There was a, we found an older lady in the back row that didn't want to move. She wanted to die in the mm. plane. And fortunately, oh there was gosh. a lady back there that basically grabbed her arms and pulled her out of the seat and started moving, pushing her. And I was right behind them, right? Going behind them. So there were heroes like that all over the plane. Oh, that's amazing. You know, it, we, we do, uh, breath work with youth athletes and how we teach them to apply uh, using breath work in a time of trauma is by putting them in 48 degree water because it, it takes your breath away. It literally sucks it out of you and puts you into a state of panic. And then you have to learn how to apply breathing to it, right? So here you guys are in 36 degree water involuntarily dealing with these conditions. What element did that cold play and how all this um, unfolded? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I don't think I've ever been asked that question. Um, you know, I, I tell you the moment where that, what you just said hit me. Because I was moving so quickly, right? I was, I was, I had adrenaline. And that's what the EMTs kept telling me. You know, because I shouldn't have been alive. I shouldn't be alive. I was in the water for seven minutes, right? And then I swam to the closest boat that I could find. So wow. I was in head deep in water. So I was moving on adrenaline. But when I got on the ferry, because I couldn't, couldn't even climb, I kept yelling, I can't, can't, can't. And then all of a sudden, two guys grabbed my arms and pulled me on the ferry. And then I'm rolling on the ice in the ferry. They said, get up. I get up. And all of a sudden, you're thinking, wow, I made it, right? I made it. And that's the moment it hit me. Because the adrenaline was down. Air temperature was 11 degrees. 
I've been in the water for an extended amount of time and I had to manage my mind and had to manage my breath. And the way I learned that is not only through swimming young, but you know, when I got in panic situations, I was used to be the head of security for a guy by the name of Tony Robbins. I've been a lot never of heard him. Him. never heard of that guy. <laughs> I don't, yeah, I don't know who, you know who he is, right? Some people still don't know who he is. But uh, I was in a lot of high leverage situations where I had to manage my mind, right? Yeah. And so part of that is what you, we just talked about, managing your breath, right? Yeah. Did and you ever walk through coals? Did, you, did he ever have you walk, walk uh, through coals, Tony Robbins? I've only done that I've, about 100 plus times. I was, there, <laughs> I was there. I was on a security team. We did a, the world record, you know, fire walking. In Kona, so yeah, I, I've done it many times, and that's about managing your mind too, right? It's not about yeah. the cold, it's about managing your mind. Yeah. So, well, so. why don't we use that as a transition and go back because, yeah. uh, you know, a mutual friend Vun introduced us. We didn't know you prior to the podcast, and when we're looking at some of your credentials, it kind of starts around Tony Robbins security on your LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. How? how do you get into that industry and come to work with that organization and him specifically? Thank you for that question, because it actually started back in 1984. This is how I got sort of made my way to what we're talking about. I had a mentor that came into my life right after college. His name was Bill. And he, I was the second assistant restaurant manager at a place called Howard Johnson. You know, my dad told me, kick me out of the house after 30 days and you got to get a job. And that was the job I got. And fortunately, though, I, you know, I was working second and third shift because I was a low man on the totem pole. But Bill and this guy named Bill and Bonnie would come in every night and have ice cream and coffee and we talk. And fast forward, I found out Bill owned over 80 movie theaters and restaurants in North and South Carolina in his life. He was a multimillionaire. And he started mentoring me on December 24th, 1984. So mm -hmm. for about 13 years, he was teaching me the mindset of success. But this is where it leads to the question you just asked. Because... Bill passed away in um, September of 1997. And I was on Tony's security team, but that's a couple of months when Tony asked me to be an assistant head of security, head of security. And how that happened was I was there to serve. I was attending his events like everybody, walking on fire, putting down brochures, right? I was there to serve because I wanted to be around that energy. Hmm. But one night, it was late at night, and I was putting down brochures with some other people, and all of a sudden, I saw his former wife. She was talking to two gentlemen, and she looked uneasy. Just didn't, she wanted to move, right? So all I did is go up to her and said, ma'am, your husband needs you in the back. That's all I said. And I started walking her back. She says, you handled that really well. So well, thank you very much. She goes, would you like to be on security? She says, a lot better putting brochures down, right? <laughs> so she put me as security in the green room for Mr. Robbins that next day. That's how I began, sitting there just watching and listening. And he started getting trust in me. And I started growing through that organization to the point where I was head of security, managing the entire order's entire security and his security around the world. You you mentioned the, uh, Bill as your mentor and from 84. Um, it, it, can you talk about, you know, how that was significant in your life and and what what you believe mentors mean to people? Well, thank you. Because you see the book in my the back from Turbo to Triumph. It's, I'm just releasing this book. This is what this book's about. It's about the power of mentorship and how important even Tony does a nice testimonial on the cover about how Jim Rohn was his mentor and how important it is and how he was my mentor after Bill left and passed on. I think it's not only helped me accelerate, but I think everybody needs somebody there who, who can give them the level set, give them direction, but more important, give them wisdom. And see, one of the things I'm finding is the people that I coach and mentor is, you know, I love speaking to millennials and younger people. They, they're extremely intelligent, but they think they got wisdom. And it takes time to get wisdom. You got to go through a lot of experiences in your life to understand what the really things was really going on. So one of the things that Bill imparted on me is his wisdom over that 13 year period. And this is what this book's about is the wisdom he taught me. But what was more interesting in the story as it came out was my mom and dad taught me the same things when I was a kid. But I didn't listen to them. They were too close. I was too close. So that what yeah. the answer to the question is this. 
Sometimes you need somebody else on the outside, right, who can give you some perspective, who is wants you to win, but can give you a different sort of take on it. So all of a sudden, maybe register in a different way. And that's that's the power of mentorship. I, you know, every great leader in this country right now, in this world, has got somebody who's taken interest in them. And it may Absolutely. be the guy down the street yeah. or the gal who is working at the, at the cash register, but they've got wisdom. And that's what it's all. I think it's, and Bill left me this before he passed away. It's my responsibility. It's your responsibility to find somebody to mentor. We, you have to find somebody to mentor to leave it to the next generation. And that's what this book's about. And I, I vowed to him that I would, I would uh, not let his, his, his wisdom die. That's the last thing he asked me to do is not let it die. And I'm not going to let it die. That's what I do what I do. And that's why I did the new seal swim to show people, give that experience, like how you can do something right at yeah. 61 years old, going back, facing your fears. So just, you're learning did Bill find you? Yeah. Did yeah. he, did Bill find you or did you find him? He come in, he kept coming into the restaurant and I was an assistant manager and we, I served him ice cream and coffee and he and his wife. And in those days, guys, that you could sit back at the booth and have a, a cold, uh, you know, cold one. And, um, light up a heater and have a conversation right and bill uh, bill, uh, <laughs> light bill, up bill passed away of lung cancer because he smoked uncountered unfiltered uh, camel since 1929 so it caught well, up do it. you know that yeah he just come in and just start talking right start talking and you know one of the things that i learned is sometimes it's better to listen right yep Love that. yeah absolutely absolutely what i, w- I want to ask a question you referenced millennials you know, when we're out talking with other uh, business leaders, you often hear people say, oh, millennials, you know, like they're so difficult. And you spoke about it from this really positive perspective, super intelligent. They're they're driven by technology. They understand all that. And then you bridged it with the wisdom piece. So for 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 business owners who are listening to this, and how do they engage millennials in a positive way where you use, uh, you know, that energy and knowledge, but they lack the wisdom to help them, you know, see that? Because we all know millennials are kind of those, they show up as, you know, entry level and want to be president in a year. How do you manage that? Yeah, that's an interesting question because one of the people that I have friends with is an expert on millennials. And he taught me some things about uh, how I could use some of the skill sets that I've learned because, one of the things that I learned about millennials is you're exactly right. My daughter, do- I have two daughters who are millennials. My first one thought she could go for the entry level to you know, and pick up the phone and talk to the president right now, the company, right? Skip everybody else. Oh, by the way, I got bored, right? So I left the company, right? And I'm like, yep. uh, I'm like freaking out a little bit. So, but one of the things I've learned about working and talking to millennials is they're all looking at what's their mission in life? Why are they here, right? What, what, so I think if I'm a business leader and I'm actually look, I look to hire millennials. I'm, I'm trying to hire somebody in every generational bracket. So I have that crossbred. But one of the things when I talk to millennials and in, in interview with millennials is I want to understand, do you understand, you know what your mission is? Why are you here on earth? What's most important to you? And so I think once I start getting in their minds a little bit and they understand, I don't know what I want to be. I don't even know what, why I'm here. Why, why don't you let me help you? If you come work with me, I'll, I'll help you with guiding you with your mission, you support, support me and what you need to do in this job and we'll all win and I'll help you get to where you want to be. So I think that's the way I handle millennials and the people that I have seen who are successful, that's the way they handle it. They set, they so set, it's really, they it's set re- boundaries, but they also help them understand what their big picture of mission, help them get to that next level. Mm, yep. That's great. So you're really trying to help give them a path for their purpose and their mission. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, I, I, I really admit it. They are, they, they, if not Gen Z, millennials are the smartest people on earth. I mean, they grew up with technology. They got it, right? And they can, they can dance around all of us with this stuff. But when it comes to making a crisis situation right or something needs to happen, and all of a sudden, this is one of the reasons I think COVID was so devastating. Uh, I don't think it was as devastating on my generation because one of the right. things about my generation is we went through the Vietnam War. We saw the race riots in 1968. We went through gas crunch in 1974. Like my dad told me, he went through the depression, right? We have seen this before, right? Millennials 
they were they were born right in that era where 9-11 was happening, but they really understand what 9-11 was. So they don't have a point of reference. So when this thing hit, the child, I, and this is one of the things I talked about, is it wasn't just about COVID. It was about the police situation, social justice, right? All the election that kept going on and on. You can't even talk to somebody about, the, about politics. And things started to stack on these folks, and they don't know how to get out of it. You know, so mm, I hope we give them a map. I draw, help them draw, understand them. there is a map, you know, a massive action plan that you can get yourself out of it. And this is why I think one of the things that we're all, it's incumbent on me and people who are, have gone through something like this to help this generation if they want to, there is a way out of this. It wasn't just about COVID. Well, you, you, you touched on the mentorship and how important it is and, um, Obviously, it's it's a passion of yours. You wrote a you wrote a book about it that's coming out. Excited to read that. Um, but how do you impart that on millennials who, you know, do feel like they know a lot um, that mentorship is important to them? Are you saying they're know it alls? Not saying that they're know it alls, but it they sounded like that. Um, but you know that that's where you're. You know, that's something that you're stressing towards is this mentorship. How do you help them? you know, yeah. see that, hey, they can impart that wisdom from somebody that, you know, can be a mentor. I'll give you an example, because this was a organization sort of mixed between Gen Z and millennials. All right. It was actually a very good audience. It's one of the younger audiences that I've been with. And what I really did is I used my learning how to swim story. I saw a story telling how I learned and the five things that I had to do. And, and all of a sudden I saw the light bulbs going off. Right. They saw that there is a pathway because I laid out a pathway for them 100 days on how I got from zero to that and th these five steps. And all of a sudden, I, this is the first time I ever spoke in this sort of way because I was like, I'm not going to get to them by the by, by, by traditional way. You know, when I speak to, you know, Gen X and baby boomers, they get it. Right. So I, I talked, I told them the story how I had to humble myself. Right. I had to go to zero. Sort of like you are right now, right? I had to, I had to figure this thing out. I had to figure that you know, the, I had to put the massive action plan together. You know, I had to understand the mission. I had to find, and this is a this is a big one for them. And they had to find, I had had to find my who for my how. Because there's a lot of things I had to get done, but I couldn't do them all. So I had to find the right people, the who's, and I surrounded myself with who's. Who became my mentors that was step number two and all of a sudden that's when the light bulbs started going off and then this, the third step is you got to put together a massive action plan but then you have to have focused execution you can't deviate right yeah you can dabble but you know if you dabble you know i could i could show you how to press decades into days but if you over here dabble you go outside of this it's going to take you a lot longer but the fifth step is what I learned in the river last year. This is the one that, that I talk about in the book is it's all about gratitude. Give you thanks to something bigger than yourself, mm. humbling yourself. And those are the five steps that I use. So to answer your question, when I shared the story on how I did it step by step on how I had to learn how to swim at 60 years old again, I think they started getting it. So that's how I would do it. I would relate a story that the, I think they would. They kids would understand stories. They want the steps, but they, they uh, if you can give them a real life experience on how you did it and lay it out with entertainment, right? You got to entertain because they'll buzz I, out. I on love them. the gratitude piece. They'll buzz yeah. out on them. Yeah, we we talk about gratitude a lot. I, I love that you tie that element into it. Um, you know. You were talking about going from serving at, at Tony Robbins organization to becoming part of the security team and then the head of the security team. I feel like you might have glossed over some details there on getting introduced that first day by the wife to becoming the head of it. How does that transpire? I'll tell you exactly how it and I, It cost me a little bit, I have to admit. Not financially, it cost me financially, but more time away from my family. And because I, w I committed, once I started, I committed I would show up. He asked me one time, we were, he said, can you be in LA, right? Uh, it's like three days from now, because he needed somebody. This is when I was just on the team. 
I wasn't, I wasn't a leader. I was nothing. I said, yeah, Tony, I'll be there for you. Right. And I showed up for him in LA, in LA from Charlotte, North Carolina to be there. So I left my job that day. I left my family, flew to LA, came back on the overnight. Right. And I want to be with my family. So it did cost me some time because that's when my kids were growing. And that's one of the biggest regrets that I have. I probably, you know, I probably should have geared back, but I committed, I committed to him that I would be there for him. And so I, he had certainty in me. So he knew if he needed something like we were, I'll give you an example. We were in Australia. I was like, the assistant head of security at that point. He said, you want to go play golf? All right. I was the only golfer on the security team. He said, I need clubs. He didn't have any clubs. And we're in Brisbane, you know, Queens, Australia, where Queensland, wherever, wherever that is. Right. So I had to figure it out. Right. So where do I go in Brisbane to get custom made clubs for a six, seven guy? I didn't even know what I'm talking about. Right. And I figured it out. I brought these clubs back. You know, I paid for them out of my own pocket. I got reimbursed, which was very nice. But that also, <laughs> that also shows that, you know what? I can count on him to do something and get it done. Right. So it's all about certainty. And that's what I think all these things that I did gave him certainty, certainty, certainty to the point where when it was time to replace the, the other gentleman who'd been there for a long time, it was like, I know he can handle it. Right. I know yeah. he'll show up. And that's what leaders are looking for. They're looking for people who can give them certainty. And leaders uh, give certainty. Very, very simple, right? But it's uh, very simple, but not a lot of people understand it. Right. Exactly. Like it. Well, going back to that, because I, I know that you do a lot of with, um, you know, PTSD and help people um, that have experienced it. And I'm guessing that, you know, we started with this idea of you going back last year um, to do the swim. Um, did you feel like you had PTSD, uh, some type of it, or, um, and how did you overcome that to, you know, go back and get that redemption? Good question. I, I never knew or thought that I ever had PTSD. I know there were moments I would wake up in the middle of the night and, you know, all of a sudden this things would flash in my head, but what really came to light for me was probably three or four years after. And this is right before the movie came out. And I was approached by AARP magazine. They wanted to interview me. And I said, why? You know, I'm young. Who am I going to tell a bunch of old people they already know, right? They said, there's two universities that have been doing a study on you on how you grew out of a traumatic life event compared to other people on that plane, including some of the leadership. What did you do differently? So I did this interview with AARP magazine. And I shared the strategies on how I grew out of a traumatic life event instead of going into a depressed state, which then turned into a TED talk, which then turned into, wow, there is a way to grow. It's called post-traumatic growth syndrome. Now it's being, people are starting to talk about this subject, but I don't, I don't ever think I went into that depression or even deep depression. I just think I, I used the skill sets that I had to be able to take it in a different direction where other people still haven't got back on a plane yet. So I, fortunately for me, I went back on the plane the next day. Now people say <laughs> pretty quick. That's the expression of getting back on the horse. Exactly. Uh, so so to answer funny. your question about going back into the river, it's the same analogy. I had to go back, even though I didn't fear the river, it was like, okay, if I go back and face it this time on, and this time, what's most important, leave on my terms. It's one of the things I, I learned from my dad, Bill, Tony, always try to leave on your own terms. This last year was about leaving on my own terms. Wow. I like that. Yeah, I like that. Um, so can you talk a little bit about, um, cause you mentioned that there's the strategy that you took, is that to leave on your own terms or is there additional strategies when, the, when you did that Ted talk on how you, you know, overcame this, you know, this PTSD you experienced and, and grew, turned it into this uh, PT, PTGT or, or how you're calling it. <laughs> PTGS. Um, PTGS, thank TED, you. In my TED talk, he only gave you 17 minutes, so you got to roll, right? So yeah. I only laid out a couple, but the one that I think is most important, even though there's a few other things that I did, 
uh, was I, I reframed the meaning of the plane crash. Because uh, meaning is meaning equals emotion, emotion equals your life. Whatever meaning you attach to something is what your life is. And that really came to me shortly after the plane crash. I knew it, you know, intellectually, but then when I visualized it and saw it in person, and it happened in the green room of Good Morning America. We just got done being interviewed, myself, a bunch of passengers, the crew, all that stuff, right? And we were in this, it got done, and all of a sudden, we're, you know, we're back in the green room, and this one passenger just started yelling for no reason. And I'm thinking, what's wrong with this guy, right? I mean, we survived the plane crash. We're on national TV. What's wrong, right? What's, what's, what's up with this guy? Well, then what I found out is he is going, was going through a divorce and he lost his job. So the meaning he attached to the plane crash was devastation. The meaning I attached it was a blessing because it gave me a whole different perspective to be able to help people. Same situation, two different meanings, two different pathways for our life. So one of the things that I do when people, I, you know, get, I get this call maybe once or twice a year, you got to talk to this guy or gal, right? Uh, I mean, you got to talk to him right now. Is first thing I talk about is what meaning they're attaching to this situation. And I'll give you a perfect example. I was actually in my car driving back from speaking down in Georgia. I got a call from a friend said, you got to talk to this young lady. She's locked in a cavern in northern Ontario. She won't come out. She just survived the avalanche over in Nepal. And she was one of the four survivors. She will not come out. You got to talk to her. I said, what can I talk to her about? Right? I've never been in a, you know, an avalanche, right? But I've been in a plane crash, right? Because everybody's got their personal plane crash experiences, like an avalanche. Yep. So I talked to her. And I found out the meaning was, why did I, why did I live and everybody else died? And she couldn't get over it. She had survivor guilt. So I, I told her, I told my friend, I said, give me a couple weeks, all right? Let me sort of get my head together on this. So through my network, I, I, I had a network that I found somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody in Ethiopia. And I talked to this young man. This young man every day had to get up, go get water for his family, right? He, had, he, he wore sandals. He didn't have any shoes. So, okay. So I arranged a three-way, actually it was a four-way phone call with the lady in Ontario, my friend, this guy in Ethiopia, and me. And I says, could you tell her your story? He told her what he had to do every day just to survive. So I used the power of contrast. So, you know, you think you're having a bad day, right? This guy every day has got scratch just to get some food for his family. And all of a sudden, I could hear it in her, in her tone of voice. But you know what? I, maybe I did survive for a different reason, right? And then I told her what happened to me on an interview in Montreal three or four days after the plane crash. And the question came to me was, why do you think, I just, it was actually a month because, it's a, remember the plane crash in Buffalo where everybody died? I did this interview and they asked me, why do you think they died and you lived? I'm on, I'm on national TV in Canada. And I'm like, whoa, I'm on ready for that one. I said, maybe it just wasn't my time. Maybe I have a different mission. And I think, Putting all that together, I gave her a different meaning for Nepal. That she had a different, she has a reason for living. Now, I don't know where she is in the last few years, but I knew at least in that moment, she understood, right? All right, maybe, maybe I'm here for a different reason. Maybe I don't have it that bad, right? I think that, and that, so the power of meaning and contrast, um, you know, I use all these skill sets to help people. Well, it sounds like after you know, that traumatic experience, what you did is, it almost sounds like you accept that you were intentionally put there, you know, rather than it just be happenstance or something that happened to me, it's like purposeful so that then you can incorporate, you know, meaning into that. That's a very good distinction. That's exactly what I believe. I, um, hmm, that's I, pretty cool. You know, I believe that I was put there for a reason and a purpose. I wasn't supposed to be on that plane, right? I wasn't. Schedule on the five o'clock flight, and all of a sudden I'm there in the middle of something, right? Maybe, maybe all of us were on that plane for a reason. And when I talked to that captain in Orlando, he sort of gave me that perspective. Maybe all those passengers that day were in the seats they were supposed to be in that moment because no one freaked out. 
people help people. Everybody had a common mission. I think I was supposed to be on that plane for a reason. And whether it was to help other people that day or maybe help a bigger mission, um, I've used it to be able to help other people and fulfill the promise I made to build my mentor that I would not let what he taught me die. And I think that's the big reason is because I had not fulfilled that promise. One of the things my dad taught me is, you, you know, you're only good as your word. So maybe that's one reason I didn't die that day is because I had fulfilled that promise. Well, uh, how did, so it, it looks like you leave the Tony Robbins organization, what, a couple years after that event? Can, can you talk us through making that decision and, and why you did it? Great question. It wasn't my decision. I was, in, I was in Chicago with Tony. We were doing a fire walk that night. And he called me into a suite. And I had been talking to Tony over those last, those last few years, right? We were having some really intimate one-on-one -on -one talks. And I was trying to get some coaching on media and things like that because I didn't, I don't know how to handle this stuff, right? He called me into a suite and said, you know what? Maybe it's time for you to go out and do your own thing. You know, you're, it's time now. You need to cut the cord. You need to do this and not don't look back. Burn the boats, right? Burn the boats and just do it. He said, I'm going to find somebody else to take this over. I'm going to give you the opportunity to do it yourself. So hmm. he actually, that Friday night in, in, in Chicago, just gave me the freedom because I was holding on to that because you know what? I was there to serve, but I had a different mission now. I had a different mission. And he knew that. He recognized that. And I think he intentionally cut my cord so I could be forced to do that. And that's what happened. So I that's still really to this cool. day, you know, very kind. You're right. I say he wrote a nice testimonial for my book. He's, he and I are still friends today, and I call him a close friend. And he was he mentored me for those for those years. But sometimes you have to have somebody cut the cord for you, right? Because maybe you're just yeah. hanging on because that's that's your certainty, right? Did he tell you? Did he tell you he's cutting your cord, or you just he was just uh, hey, it's time, it's your time. It's, it's basically said, it's your time. Go do, do it. Because one of the that's things awesome. about it, now, inside baseball, is every time I pick him up at the helipad or the airport or the, or a car, right? He'd ask me how things are going. He's still working for that company. And I said, yeah. He goes, why? Why? You know, go out on your own. You're... And I would give him excuses. And one of the things you don't do to Tony is give him excuses because he could bat him down <laughs> pretty quick, right? He could knock him down, man. He's just... So finally got to a point where I had, he had more excuses, right? You know? And it's like, you know, he's, and it's like, you got to do this. He says, you got to be on your own. It's the only time, you're gonna, only real freedom you have is that you're going to work for yourself and build it yourself. He said, I know it's scary, but you can do it. You have the skill sets. And when Tony sort of gets in your grill, right? He, but he does it with love, right? He does it with love. So you know he's coming from his heart. And he always told me, always come from your heart in everything you do. And that's, that's what I do. I try to come from my heart with people when I have to be straight with them and tell them, hey, let me sort of give you, tell, tell you where the, uh, nine, yeah, the 411 really is, right? Uh, so you know, that was, it was a great night. You know, I look back that night, I was sort of like thinking, like, why am I, why are we doing this? But it was a great night for me. So what's day one like after you take that advice from Tony? Like, where do you start? First thing I did, it wasn't day one, it was probably week two. But that, that you know, general getting my head straight and doing all this is I hired my first EA, Tammy. I, I needed a wingman. I needed somebody because... I'm really good at driving revenue. That was what I did for 30 years, right? I wasn't good at all the other crap, right? And I needed somebody to have my back. So I hired Tammy. Tammy came on with me pretty much 20 hours a week or more when I needed her. And she would, she would handle all that stuff so I could just focus on driving revenue, marketing Dave, trying to figure this thing out, right? So it gave me the leverage in the, in the runway. And that's why I coach people say, so, you know, a lot of people go out and try to do it themselves now and they're by themselves, don't have anybody or don't think they can afford anybody to do it. You can't afford not to do it because you need to have that runway to think and so you can you know, research and know what you need to go to, your pathway. But so if you're doing that and the administration and the marketing and all these other things, you can't focus. You, you know, um, pivoting a little bit, I see it, what looks like an American Red Cross behind your head. And uh, Little Birdie told me you've raised almost $15 million for them over the years. Can you just talk about like where the passion for that comes from and 
how does somebody decide to raise that amount of that's significant how, how do you go about that well it really started that day on the hudson river because i had three red cross experiences um you know uh, you know when i got to shore in, in new jersey when they gave me a blanket you know when they gave me clothes when i had no clothes in the hospital when i got back to charlotte the ceo of the red cross here in charlotte was taking care of my family so i wanted to give back to them so the, that ceo her name was pam called me and asked me if I would speak at her local fundraiser. And all of a sudden, 200 people show up. I don't know what I'm going to say, right? But I talk. And I got to their hearts, and they raised a lot of money that day, right? So all of a sudden, I started getting invited to speak at other Red Cross events. But what really trans what sort of transformed and really sort of allowed me to help them on a bigger scale is when I got invited to go to Washington, D.C. and speak for their national convention and that night at the Supreme Court. And wow. I got to share my story to 400 of the it's called Tiffany Circle ladies who are ladies who donate a significant amount of money. And we raised $6 million that night. Wow. That's awesome. So, so is that where is that where you started to get to that place of like, hey, I can be a speaker and I want to get into this the speaking business? I mean, because you saw, obviously, you've seen Tony Robbins do it and uh, very successfully. Yeah, and I, one of the things Tony told me, and I, I, I did, I did the Zig Ziglar approach. The first 70 events that I did, I didn't take a dime. I just practiced and practiced and practiced, right? So I got it down in here. So just, it's in my heart. So I can walk on stage without notes and deliver. But what happened, so part two of that night in Washington, D.C., um, I was being watched by a couple of speaking bureaus. One was based in Washington, D.C. So I called Bill up, said, Bill, if you want to come see me speak, I'm over here at Supreme Court. You know, if you want to come with me, be my guest, right? And he saw me speak. He saw the impact that I had. He said, we sign you right now. I said, what does that mean? <laughs> he was, we want, we want, to, we want to, to market you and we'll pay you. Really? You pay for this stuff, right? Yeah. Wow. It's a good gig, right? So that's how that happened, right? I, he, I, I just, he knew who I was. I was introduced to him, but I invited to hear me in Washington, D.C. And all of a sudden, now I'm getting paid to speak all over the, all over the country, now all over the world. But then, um, you know, we grew, I grew to a point where it's not that I didn't need them anymore, but I outgrew them, right? I'm to the point now where people are calling me directly. It's like, why am I paying them 25%, right? Uh, even though I still love my speaking to our friends, I, you know, love them so that's how that changed that's how it started right then that night it was sort of like the the, the transformation and because you know if you average out my events you know we, I, when i would walk into an event and they'd ask me to speak we we're going to raise close to a hundred thousand dollars that night that day wow. that was my average so that's awesome you know, i could go to fargo north dakota and raise that or i go to dallas texas and you know raise that or more and I, people know that I would deliver for them, and I would not. I don't. I never accepted a cent from the Red Cross except for expenses. That's amazing. Gave, That's amazing. This book back here, Moments Matter. I gave ten percent of the, that taking of uh, that, that that revenue back to the Red Cross, which is a part of the fourteen point seven million. Can you tell us a little bit about Moments Matter and uh, what you know for people that are listening, um, so that they can uh, pick it up? Uh, pretty, that's my first book. And um, it's really about the mindset and the skills I had to use that day uh, to survive the plane crash. I talk about the 12 sort of skills and strategies I had to do and, and what I really learned from that experience. Uh, but how it was interesting because the book wasn't going to be called Moments Matter until I got a phone call of where I'm sitting right here from my wife. And she called me and I was in here doing some things about writing the book. She goes, you know, a couple of our neighbors, they needed some help getting the TV on. They called, can you go down and help them get your TV worked out? Now, these were two older ladies, and they needed some help. And I don't know where y'all grew up. I grew up in a small town where everybody helped everybody, especially your elders, right? And they're your neighbors. So I go down there, I get your TV fixed pretty quick, and they're like, would you like to stay for milk and cookies? Now, I love milk and cookies. I, I, love, I, I love them, right? If someone's going to bake me milk and cookies, I'm all in, right? Uh, <laughs> especially older ladies, you could probably bake. 
So yeah. they're in there getting their cookies ready to go, right? Not sitting down south, we got these things called parlors, right? Sitting rooms, right? So I'm in the sitting room or parlor, and they have all these books and basically a lot of history books about World War II. I'm like, this is this, I've never seen these, right? I love history. I'm looking through these books, and like, ooh, I've never seen these things. And they came out and said, hey, where did you get these books? Because I want to buy some, right? They both looked at me and rolled up their sleeves and showed me the letters and numbers down their arm. Hmm. Oh, whoa. They survived the concentration camp. Wow. I said, tell me the story. So about two, three hours, I heard this story, how they survived the concentration camp when the rest of their family died. And they vowed to stay together the rest of their lives. They were 77 years old. That's awesome. So I came back to where I'm sitting right now. I said, I got it. They made all the moments in their life matter from that experience. And this is what this experience is about. I'm going to make all your moments. I can make my, I'm making all these moments matter. And you too can too. If you just follow, do the right things, right? That's what this book's yeah. about. Is if you do these things to do the right things, all, you'll make all the moments in your life matter. And that's how the book came about. That's, that's, that's amazing. That's that's great. Uh, it hits close to home for you, I'm sure, too. All right. Well, we're getting to that time where uh, did, did they prep you that we would do a little rapid fire fun questions? All right. Um, if you could invite any one person to dinner, um, who would you invite? Dead or alive? Either one. <laughs> Ronald Reagan. All right. Good one. Uh, what would a perfect day look like for you? Uh, basically, I control my own time. <laughs> that would be a perfect day for me. You know, getting up when I want, being around who I want, and, you know, being able to go to a ball game when I want. And uh, that, hey, that just be my perfect day, just to be able to be around the people I want and go to go to you know, having experiences I want to have experiences with. All right. Well, this is uh, related. You're you're waking up and um, you could have any one ability that maybe you don't have today. What would that be? I think I'm developing it, but it's, it's the power of focus. Being able to, that's the power of the genius, right? They can focus in. And that's the, that's the power I've always wanted. I, I have it spotty. But if I can wake up right now and say, from this point on, I can laser focus at any second in time, that's the power right there to be able to get things accomplished. What time of the day do you carve out your me time? Uh, it's usually 4.30 in the morning. Uh, sunrise or sunset? Uh, sunrise. The 4.30 in the morning, right? Yeah. Yeah, connects. What's the weirdest thing you've ever eaten? Yeah. I would say Hudson River. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of crap in the Hudson River. I don't know if y'all know that or not. And it goes in your mouth. Yeah, no, that's that's probably. I mean, uh, that's I mean, I would say drink, not eat. But yeah, there's food in there too. Unfortunately, this thing is playing the river. Yeah, it's a it's a chunky river. What's strange is oh, I man. for, I still got for some reason my nose, guys, still got to smell my nose. Yeah. My, I remember my father telling me that as a kid, he would water ski in the Hudson River. Uh, but uh, I don't know if that's real or not. Rough water, right. man. Maybe when he was a kid. Yeah. He's a hell of a man if he did that, all right? All right, Dave. Well, uh, the show's called Discover the Difference, so we always wrap up with uh, two questions surrounding okay. that topic. So you want to kick her off, Gabe? Sure. Um, this one is a reflective one. When you're reflecting back, on your life and you want to give advice now you're a mentor to your younger self so um what would you what would you tell your younger self right now uh i would tell my younger self really be happy every day every day above ground is a great day uh i think a lot if i was young when i was younger i probably would dwell on a lot of things and i would say you know what every day above ground is a great day be happy I think it's the advice I would give to my uh, younger self. Okay. I like that. I like that. So everybody has a key ingredient to their secret sauce. What, what is that key ingredient that um, makes you who you are? I would say that 
the key ingredient that I would have is the ability to take action. I, I don't ever leave anything without taking action. And so I think that is, that's my secret sauce. And that's why I think it only happened that day on the river uh, in the, on the plane crash, but being able to do what I've been able to accomplish is because I won't, I don't wait around. I'll take it. I always take an action. Every time I make a goal, I make an immediate action. I think that is my power. Love that. I yeah. love that. Well, you have an, I mean, you have an amazing story and you've inspired so many people, not just from, um, you know, the miracle on the Hudson, but just, um, the way you've lived your life and how you supported people um, along the way. Uh, where can people find you um, that are listening here? Listening here. Well, thank you. I think go to my website, Dave Sanders to speaks.com. Um, we're, I'm really proud. We just put my new website up a couple of weeks ago. I love for people to check it out. Um, plus, you know, my books are there. Plus I just uh, issued my first issue of my new magazine moments matter, which they can get a free copy if they go, uh, go on my website. So check it out. Dave Sanders to speaks.com. Awesome. Thanks so much. We'll do. We'll do. Well, hey, thanks for coming on, Dave. We really appreciate your time. And we're looking forward to telling your story to, to our listening audience. Thank you very much. I love the baseballs in the back, too. That's tremendous. I You had a baseball reference earlier. It sounds like you, you follow the sport, I assume. I do. I do. I, ever since I was a, a bat boy for a day in 1967 for the Cincinnati Reds. So, yes. Oh, that's it. That sounds like a dream come true right there. How'd that happen? Oh, my mom entered me in a contest at Kroger. And I got no to <laughs> sit on the bench with Tommy Helms and Johnny Bench and Pete Rose. And I was like, oh, my gosh. What? And at Crosley Field. Listen, wow. Oh yeah. That's amazing. So uh, That's amazing. I love the baseball stuff in the back. And part of my book, I actually talk about the, it's called The Pitch. The point in time that changes everything. Right? And I use a baseball analogy about that pitch is coming, right? That's the point in time that changes everything. And you can use that the same way in your life. Yeah, that, I love that. That's a ball for every team I've coached. And uh, I didn't play, uh, but fell in love with the sport and love coaching the kids. Well, it looks like you got some quite good some teams back there. And uh, congratulations that you're impacting the youth. And that's what's going to get this country through with the, the challenges we're having right now. Teaching these kids discipline and morals, if, you know, keeping their mind right being around the right peer groups. Absolutely. What's 100%. the what's the plaque that's right behind the right above the American uh, American Red Cross? Looks like a sword. Right above it? It's actually yeah. yeah, it's actually a real Bowie knife that was been passed down through generations in my family. Uh, my dad gave it to me right before he passed away. So it's an actual Bowie knife. I think it's 80, 90 years old. Wow. That's, that's so cool. cool. Very well, cool. Well, I, I feel like we can keep talking for hours on end, but uh, we might have to do a follow up once you get the book uh, fully launched and uh, continue continue with the success. Yeah, congratulations! I'm Thanks for your you time. For I'm really humbled and honored to be with you guys today. I look forward to hopefully further conversations.